thank you, Sister Terry Ann DeYonker, for being with us today. I'm sure you left your desk with quite a few stacks on it. Well, there are a few things to do, for sure. It's kind of a wind down yeah, time. Yeah, transition, sorting, yes. uh, keeping the important things, letting go of other things <laughs> that uh, don't have to be passed on. So, yeah. A fun time. It, it's an interesting time. Yeah, there's some fun, but it's, uh, you know. Well, it's a pause to also reflect on your years of ministry for the congregation. Yes. And please be know how grateful we are for those years. Thank you. And that you will be missed. Thank you. When I, when I think of Sister Terry Ann DeYonker, I think of her being like bookends for Dominican High. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> because you were a student there. I was back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, graduated in 61, and then went back as the president in 96 until it closed in 2005. And really, um, I was delighted to be back there because I loved the place. And I loved my years, high school years there and loved the sisters that were there and my friends. And it was just a wonderful, blossoming time, I think, in my life. And then going back, um, I only had two challenges. One was to get the uh, enrollment up, increase mm -hmm. the enrollment, and the other was to get uh, increase the number of donors so that we had more income. And when I went there, that was the challenge, and I engaged a lot of people in trying to make that happen. We did, for a time, mm -hmm. uh, do some increase in funding. We had a couple of um, fundraising uh, campaigns, raised some significant funds uh, with the support of the archdiocese, the congregation, lots of individual alumni. Oh, and um, Loyal so alumni. Loyal alums. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, in the end, we did not get enough students. Mm -hmm. um, and I always said that if we could have offered the education for free, we would have been full. But we could be knocking at the door. Yeah, we yeah. couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so I, my dream was always to fill the place again. Um, we never did that. Mm -hmm. And after we closed in 2005, which was a kind of a sad moment. I mean, for I mean, lots of alumni came back to visit and reminisce, and we had a big celebration. Of course, at the end, the students and the parents were sad about it closing. And I was sad about it closing, but I also had a confidence that we had done everything possible to keep it going. And um, it just wasn't meant to be because it was an affordability issue, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my delight was that after it closed and we sold it to the Winans Academy, a charter school, they not only filled the building with students, but they put up three uh, portable um, classrooms on Rosary Field with the overflow. And so I said, oh, see, Amazing. if we could offer it for free, because it yes. was a public school, right. charter school, then it would fill. And mm -hmm. that's something we could never do, so. And that still is going on. It is still going yes. and it's still thriving. Well, and that was a well-built school. Oh, though. absolutely. Yes. Very that, well. Do they have the convent too? The convent um, was taken down, I believe, in 19, uh, or no, 2011, maybe, mm -hmm. 10, 11, somewhere around there, uh, because it did need a lot of upgrading and updating. We had uh, tried to um, see if the school, the new mm -hmm. charter school, would want it, and uh, they did not have the funds to do the work that would have needed to run the plumbing and electricity. So. Uh, they did not choose to buy it. So in the end, we decided uh, rather than um, invest any more, mm -hmm. and we didn't know how we would use the building, mm -hmm. uh, we decided to tear it down. And in the end, the school bought the property after the building was down. So oh, anyhow, so they've expanded. So when you were a student, when you entered as a freshman, uh, were you, is that the first time you met the Adrian Dominicans? It is, yeah. Well, no, that's not true. I was, <laughs> I forgot that. Uh, back in... Um, when I started school, first grade and, and half a second grade, I went to St. Ambrose, and that was staffed, of course, by uh, oh. Adrian Dominican. So I had my start there, but then never had any contact again with the Adrian Dominicans until I went to high school. And my dad said he wanted me to go to Dominican because the education was good. 
there was a new high school opening in the area, uh, and, and a lot of my classmates from St. Joan of Arc were going there. But he said, no, I want you to go to Dominican mm -hmm. because they have a very good uh, education. And was true. At the beginning, I was sad, of course, because I wanted to go where my friends went. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I was there a week at Dominican before I realized he had made a good choice, mm -hmm. or both parents had made mm -hmm. a good choice. Yeah. Uh, and tell me about your siblings. Uh, there are seven of them. Uh, we are eight altogether. I'm the eldest. Uh, I have six sisters and a brother. The poor brother. Or well, he's did a he very a spoiled of... brother, yes. And uh, we, where, where we remind he, him of that. He's where, the youngest, actually. Where does he live? He lives in Georgia. And actually, most of us are spread around the country. Three of us are in the Detroit area, two in uh, Arizona, one in California, and one in Wisconsin. So we're all over. Nice places to visit. Where did the name Terry Ann come from? You know, I asked my mother that once mm -hmm. upon a time because it is so unique, especially mm -hmm. the way I spell it. And um, she said, oh, I don't know. She said, I just liked it. So. Have you ever met another Terry Ann? I have now, yes. Oh. And spelled the same way as mine. So oh, that is kind of fun. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. yes. And um, what was, was your mother a, a home keeper? My mother would say she was a homemaker, but mm -hmm. my mother was a physician. She was an osteopath. That's where my mother and dad met in oh. uh, the School of Osteopathy in uh, Kirksville, Missouri, where they were both working, uh, you know, to get their degrees. Now, uh, when it, she never practiced on her own, she was in with my dad until I was born and then kind of helped out a little bit until the, my sister was born and then she was full-time homemaker. Mm -hmm. And that, to this day, that's what she would say, mm -hmm. that she would name herself a homemaker. Mm -hmm. uh, were they both from Michigan? Uh, he was from Michigan. Uh, my mother was from New York. Medina, New York is where she grew up. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. Well, happy marriage. Yeah. Right? Yes, well, again, they met. Uh, and she's interesting because she says, when she, uh, it, the tradition in her family was that the women became teachers and she did not want to be a teacher. And so she went to medical school. She also didn't want to be a nurse. So she went and became a doctor instead. But I said, your whole practice was raising us and taking care of our medical needs and you know, being a good mom and a good yeah. provider for sure. But uh, what, that was unusual, I'm sure, for a woman to become uh, receive a medical degree. Absolutely it yeah. was. And uh, she had another woman, there was a couple that they went to school with that were lifelong friends mm -hmm. and the uh, wife was also a physician. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think the two of them kind of palled around, you know, mm -hmm. together. And, and it, from some of the pictures I remember seeing of their college days, it seemed to me that uh, uh, there were other women also in the mm -hmm. class. So. I don't know what the attraction, what that particular school mm -hmm. had in terms of attracting uh, women, but yeah. Um, tell me this, did your dad ever treat any of the Asian Dominicans? <laughs> he did treat some. In fact, I remember, um, oh gosh, let's see, where was I living? I think I was at St. Ambrose. And um, there was a sister coming in from Adrian, and I don't know that I can recall her name. I didn't know her, but I knew of her. And she had had some kind of back trouble. And of course, he was an osteopath. Mm -hmm. He also went on for his degree in psychiatry, which he was practicing at the time. But he still did some of the manipulation that um, osteopaths did. So I called him to see if he would help her because she was obviously in pain. And when I got him, he had just gotten home from work. I, I could tell by his voice he was very tired. He said, well, you know, I just got home from work. I said, oh, I'm sorry, but could you help her? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, well, give me about 15 minutes to eat my dinner and I'll meet you at the office, which we did and wow. he treated her and she was better after that. So wow. she was always Magical very hands. <clears throat> very, yeah, he was very skilled. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terry Ann, um, t tell the story, if you will, about your work with and how you got hired for the director of 
uh, uh, separated and uh, widowed. Okay. That, that Is that be, a divorced? The beginning experience. Yes. Separated, divorced, divorced and widowed. Yeah. Yes. Beginning. Thank you. Beginning yeah. Beginning experience. experience. Um, let's was see. Was it in the eighties or it was early nineties? It was in the eighties. Uh, I had. I was fresh out of social work school, just receiving my master's degree. That was at U of M, wasn't that it? That was at U of M. Mm -hmm. And I had... Um, um, you had a private practice? I had just started. I was just trying to think how long mm -hmm. I had been in practice, but maybe not six months, I'm sure. I was really new into my private practice mm -hmm. at St. Raymond's in Detroit. and. Uh, uh, Bud Ozar called from the Family Life Office for the Archdiocese of Detroit and said, you know, we're thinking about starting a divorce ministry. And he said, I really want to have a brother or a sister in that role because I think the uh, role modeling that a brother or a sister religious would provide would say, uh, yes, you can be celibate, and continue your life and be very happy. And he said, I think people who are divorced or widowed may not realize that they can be happy ever wow. again. So he said, I I'd like to talk to you about it. So we talked and he hired me. Uh, at, at the beginning, it was just one day a week <clears throat> that I did this. And uh, as part of the ministry, he said, I think you should make a beginning experience weekend, which is a weekend model somewhat on marriage encounter weekends, uh, though they have a series of talks given by individuals who are divorced or widowed. And then in this particular program, we had uh, small groups of people and the small groups stayed the same. Uh, you stayed with the same people for the whole weekend. And you wrote uh, about your experience of grief, whatever stage of grief you were at. And as a result, it was, it was one of the most powerful ministries I've been involved in because I could see the Paschal mystery working. Oh. You know, people were coming from the Dips. most despondent <clears throat> depths and depression and anger and all kinds of feelings, rejection and um, abandonment, all those feelings. And they would come into this weekend and they would meet other people experiencing something similar and they'd say, oh my gosh, well, I'm not alone. Oh, well, I'm not crazy. I, you know, these feelings are natural and normal and other people are feeling it. So they would share with each other. And you could feel during the course of the weekend, you could feel the mood beginning to lighten as they were able to not only write down in journals, but also share in the small groups what their experience was and what they were feeling and to have them just received. Nobody was trying to fix anybody. It wasn't therapy, it was just simply a sharing and a support program. But by the uh, end of it, people were experiencing the feelings of resurrection, the feelings of new life, the feelings of hope again, the feelings that, oh my gosh, my life is worth something even though I've been through this loss. Amazing. It is. Was Beginning Experience an international organization? It was <clears throat> beginning to be international when I uh, got into it. I was the third executive director. It had been going since 1975. and Just in the Detroit area? No, no. Oh. it started actually in Texas, Dallas, mm -hmm. Texas. And what they would do would go in and work with the local family life office to get a group started mm -hmm. in a particular diocese or archdiocese. And so um, we had several teams across the United States, different cities, and then they had been to Hawaii, so they were moving west, and then they uh, had been to Australia and New Zealand by the time I took over. During my time, we went to Ireland and Northern, we, we went first to Northern Ireland, then to Ireland, and then to Singapore, we went into Asia, and so it is now definitely international, strongly international. Didn't you bring together uh, international or uh, meetings in the United States? I mean, like what we would call conventions. We, we have a convention every two years and uh, an international convention. All of them at that, that point, I think even now, are still just in the United States, but we also 
had grown so large that we also started having regional uh, conventions on the off years. And that would afford local people more of an opportunity to go because they didn't have the you know, airfare to go to the states. What an amazing, amazing ministry. It was. Yes. It was and is, yeah. I think they're on their fifth executive director mm -hmm. now, so it just keeps going on. And, and then I think of, the, of the, your ministry in British Columbia. Yeah. That, that, working with the First Nations people. That was a real joy. That uh, really, I, I cannot, I, I really fell into that. Again, it was a matter of the bishop in the British Columbia, Prince George, British Columbia, which is about 500 miles north of Vancouver, British Columbia. And four of us were up there and working for the Diocese of Prince George. And the bishop really had a great heart for the First Nations people who had gone to residential schools in Canada. Now, during the course of my time up there, I learned that when those residential schools began, the government started them. The express purpose was to get the Indian out of the Indian. When I heard that, I thought, mm. oh my God, how could we not be involved mm. in this? So the, the ministry that I was particularly involved in was called Returning to Spirit. And it um, sought to reconcile the people who went to the residential schools or their relatives with the church people, I'll call them church people, mm -hmm. who ran the schools. So the Catholics ran them, the Anglicans ran them, uh, the United Church ran them, and those folks, their charge was to make them white. D, D, Scandalous. De-Indian them. De-Indian De them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just uh, awful because mm -hmm. the stories that the First Nations people would tell about we couldn't speak the language, we couldn't dress in our native dress, our hair was all cut, our food was all different, we couldn't pray the way we were used to, and they were taken away from their villages and their families for long periods of time. Some of them, when they would go, would not see their families again for some years. Others would see them maybe once a year because the f schools were in local areas, whereas the First Nation reserves were out in more rural areas. So that was this a government plan? It was started by the government, yes. They're, they're closed now. Mm -hmm. I think the last one closed in the maybe 96 or so, as I recall. And um, so the program was actually a three-week commitment. The first week or one week would be all First Nations. So a team of First Nations people would present the program and take people, participants through it. Another week would be non-Aboriginal people. And that was the team I was on at the time. And we would take people through the same process, but only with non-Aboriginal people. And then the third week, the two groups would come together for reconciliation. Oh. And I'm telling you, I didn't experience anything so powerful as the reconciliation where oh. folks who for years Either they or their families, you know how stories mm -hmm. get embellished as they come down mm -hmm. the generations. So the legacy of those residential mm -hmm. schools has just devastated many of the First Nations communities too. Yeah. So who, who were the pretty. sisters living in Prince George with you at the time? At the time was Jean Marie Leitonen, mm -hmm. uh, Jude Van Balen, and Beverly Babola and I. And uh, what was that bishop's name? I know he was Bishop a... Jerry Wiesner. Is he, he was... still there? He is not. He retired about uh, maybe four years ago. Oh, eight, yeah, probably about four years ago. And he lives in Saskatoon with uh, his community. Mm -hmm. He was an oblate of Mary Immaculate. And the new bishop uh, came from Vancouver. He's a diocesan priest, and, a di and so. He yeah, comes from that tradition, yeah. Uh, was, wasn't the uh, ministry in Brit uh, Prince George part of the in uh, initiatives that were started during Sister Donna Markham's time? Yes, yes. It was one of those congregation initiatives mm -hmm. where uh, she contacted bishops in various areas and said, do you have any needs mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, and who we could meet? Sit? And then who would go? <laughs> yeah. So they, they needed someone to do family therapy, which of course that was my training. So mm -hmm. I, that's how I started when I went there. 
But then when, um, you know, the, this possibility came up, and again, the bishop was the one that said, I think you should all go make this Returning to Spirit Week program because it's about the First Nations mm -hmm. people and it'll help you in your ministry. And once I went to the first week, I mean, I was hooked and wow. asked to be trained as a trainer. So, yeah, oh. did that for about three yeah. years. Well, you had had a lot of experience of facilitating groups. Yes. I mean, you, that was certainly one of your gifts that you had given, I know, to the Nokomis chapter. Yes, right. In, in many ways for many, for many years. Yeah. And something I enjoy doing as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I have to say the um, uh, returning to spirit facilitation was like none I had ever done uh, because it really called you to put yourself on the line and f called you to be your authentic self because if you weren't willing to be authentic and real, then you couldn't ask anybody else that was participating to do the same, mm -hmm. which the premise of reconciliation is you got to be real. And, yeah. it, and when you meet for the reconciliation, it's got to be heart to heart. And so truth to truth. pretty, pretty, uh, pretty mm -hmm. stunning. I know you recently came back from the meeting of the Dominican Mother Generals, or Major Superiors, as we say, an international meeting in Rome, correct? I was part of the Dominican Sisters International Meeting, where the uh, leaders of the Dominican congregations uh, met. Sister Attracta met the next week with all the Major Superiors of all congregations throughout the world. How many, how many congregations throughout the world were represented? There were about 900 people oh. at, the, at the meeting she attended. We wow. had about 100 at ours when they were just the Dominicans. Mm -hmm. But I was so privileged to see the quality of leadership in those Dominican congregations. I mean, these women are not just brilliant, but you could tell risk takers, uh, women of integrity, uh, creative, oh my goodness, I was so I was so inspired, and I mean, really felt privileged to be part of that uh, meeting and and observe them. Aren't we? Uh, aren't the Dominican sisters in about 150 different countries? You know, I don't know that answer. Um, I'm not sure. I, th I think I be. read that. Uh, could be from about three years ago. Okay, that could statistic. Be. Yes. Yeah. Who were some of the Dominican superiors that impressed you with their story? Well, I mean, I think the uh, presentations that we had from the uh, podium that uh, we certainly had the sisters from Iraq. Uh, Sister Rihanna was there and uh, Sister Nadzik uh, spoke for her, very articulate uh, young uh, Dominican from Iraq. Uh, there were sisters from Nigeria uh, who spoke uh, and from uh, Puerto Rico and, uh, who, and from Haiti. Uh, who spoke, who gave presentations about what some of the things are, challenges that they're facing mm -hmm. in their local countries. Um, and you sit there and you listen to them and you think, oh, we, we just don't have any sense. I mean, I really appreciated the stories mm -hmm. that they told because it really touched your heart and, and they'd get finished and there would be total silence in the auditorium, you know, cause people were so moved by what they were hearing and clearly inspired by the courage mm -hmm. of these women to stay with their people. Yeah. The, uh, the, um, the other story about the Dominicans in the United States, did you find any kind of unity in your focus or your, uh, your missions of uh, like immigration? Was that pr pretty much embraced by all the American congregations or trafficking? I mean, we, we definitely are in, into that in the United States. I think what I was impressed with, because we had been, uh, the uh, DSI coordinator right now is uh, new, relatively new, and she, as a, any new person coming in, she was able to say to everybody present, these are the needs that I see, these are some solutions that I recommend. And then when the United States uh, major superiors met, uh, they talked about what do we recommend? What do we know from our experience of organizing and um, prioritizing and solutions that we've found in our own congregations that we might apply here or make suggestions here oh. of what we could do? 
So, I mean, I think that's the, when I was listening to them talk, that was what I was impressed with, their own uh, skills uh, coming out of their own congregations and other, you know, national groups that they've been a part of. So. Can you share any suggestions that were? I can't remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, that's good to yeah, hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. I don't remember the details. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, who was your sponsor, Terry Ann? Sister, uh, she was Sister Marcel Fouché, oh. Florence Fouché, former member now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. And visits here often. She comes, yeah, to mm -hmm. visit her sister, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful woman. Absolutely. And tell me this, uh, of all the, the women you have met in the congregation, um, which or um, which group or... Who is, has inspired you the most, or served even as a mentor? Well, the person that always comes forward to me is Sister Ann O'Connor. Uh, I met her when I was young, and um, uh, we just always had a connection. And you know, she was a truth teller for me and a mentor, I would say, and um, a, a wonderful listener and a, a wise elder for me. Yeah, so I was very sad when she died. Yeah, she died in her chair in Radisson. Yes, she did. Yes. Yeah, unexpectedly, uh, I think. Terry Ann, you said you met her when you were young. You mean as a, a young Dominican? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were you stationed with her or mission? No, with no, her? no, no. Uh -huh. I think it, when she was at Weber is when I met her. Ran yeah. into her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she blessed Weber with her presence. For, she did. Mm -hmm. And was she there when you were there? Yes. Yeah, I yes. Thought so. She retired when. Okay. when I was there, but okay. we loved her. Just yeah. I remember one time, um, she, I, I don't remember what the occasion was, but she was talking about how she didn't have a dress for something. And so I said, oh, well, I'll make you one. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking I could just sew up a dress. And now I don't know that I'd ever made a dress for somebody else. I'd made a number for myself. But So anyhow, we got a pattern that she liked and got some material that she liked. And I put it all together. I said, okay, now you have to try it on so I can have a little modeling, you know. And I'll never forget her walking in. It didn't fit. <laughs> I didn't think it fit. She kept it. I don't know what she ever did with it. But did anyhow, you use a that pattern? That was my effort. I certainly a did. simplicity pattern. I did. I think it was. McCall's, actually, yeah. <laughs> well, you had had training making your own habit. I, exactly, yes, right. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So one happy memory that you're going to take with you as you uh, take leave from your ministry to the congregation. Can I have two? You can have two or three. Okay. Well, one uh, that comes to mind as soon as you ask the question is the support that I have felt and I think that we have felt from especially people that live and come on this campus. Um, rarely do I walk over to St. Catherine's Chapel that somebody doesn't stop me and say, I pray for you every day or I wow. pray for your intentions or wow. I prayed for you this morning. I mean, I, you have no idea the impact of that, just knowing that that's happening, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, I think, other memory I will take is of the team that I worked with, uh, some very, very fine women, creative, fun, um, good planners, um, very faithful women. And so I will take that with me forever. For those who aren't familiar with the team's names, they are. Well, Attracta Kelly is a prioress, and um, Corinne Sanders, the administrator, Kathleen Shans, and Rosemary Abramovich. And then with Julie Heyer as well, previously. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, congratulations, and thank you for your wonderful ministry as a team and as an individual, and blessings on the way wherever that journey may take you. We Thanks. send our prayers with you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.